Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carol Newcomb Aluto, Chair of the Board of Trustees. It's great to see you all today. Today, CMC presents another forum in our Healthy Community Series, The Continuing Challenges of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. This series enjoys the support from Mount Carmel Health Systems, and today's forum is presented in partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital. Won't you please help us thank them? <clears throat> Earlier this week, there was another dispatch article on teen suicide and mental health issues that accompany this horrible trend. Why do one in five children have mental health issues and what can we do about it? Let's explore these issues with our experts. Please welcome CEO and President of Paxis Institute, Dr. Dennis Embry. <laughs> Journalist and author, Catherine <clears throat> Reynolds Lewis. Principal of Ohio Avenue Elementary School, Olympia Della Flora. <laughs> and our Healthy Community Series host, the former Health Commissioner for the City of Columbus, Dr. Teresa Long. Can I take it? Yes, it's Let's all go. yours. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Carol, and good afternoon and welcome to you all. Um, and happy birthday, Jane. And thanks again to our sponsor, Mount Carmel Health System, to our partner, um, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and to all of the sponsors. I am so glad that each of you are here uh, for this important conversation. There's no doubt it's in our news all the time. And honestly, I think it's probably in our thoughts and in our hearts all the time. So thank you to our panelists for being here. I know we're going to learn a lot. I want to share, and I regret, that Dr. David Axelson, the Chief of Psychiatry at Nationwide Children's Hospital, was called away um, and can't attend today. He was going to make a few introductory comments. Um, both he and his colleagues uh, have been fully committed to building the capacity in this community to provide and support primary and secondary prevention services, and to, see, and to that end, have spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resource, both working with our Columbus City Schools and schools that are surrounding us in, in central Ohio. So again, the hope would be to extend these, and we'll learn more about this, but to extend these efforts in communities that can use the support. And likewise, there has been a significant amount of work in the early childhood mental health arena, and there's a lot of excitement about those sorts of services as well. So stay tuned. I think we will all learn about more of those into the future. And yet, what is it that we're here to talk about today? We are going to hear from three experts um, about the rise of behavioral and mental health disorders and what some of the challenges are and how they can be successfully addressed. The demand of these, both the increases in, in again, the behavioral and the mental health disorders are placing demands on our parents, on our schools, the courts, our community at large. It, it can be staggering. So we will not be able to treat our way out of this problem. And our ability um, to jointly create efforts to provide for the best prevention services possible um, will provide, hopefully, obviously, the needed effort to stem this tide. So again, I'm pleased, and I think all of us are pleased um, today to have these remarkable guests who can speak from their knowledge, um, their experience about efforts that are underway, that show promise, that are gaining that improved population health outcomes that we all hope for. So again, without further ado, Dr. Dennis Embry, you can read his bio. I would just highlight for you, and it may not be in the bio on your uh, program, that he um, has done a lot of work around this country um, and sit, sits on several, uh, co-investigator for several national projects. But his work and Paxis, his organization, the president of Paxis Institute, has prevention and research projects both nationally and internationally. And his prevention work focuses now on low cost 
robust evidence-based kernels, I think we'll hear about kernels, and behavioral vaccines. So Dr. Embry, I'll get to you. He said I could call him Dennis, so we'll call him Dennis. Um, <laughs> let me also just again reintroduce Catherine Reynolds-Lewis. She is an award-winning um, author and journalist and speaker. We will hear more about the good news um, about bad behavior, but really talking about, again, how do we move um, to rebuilding some of this lost self-control, resolving family conflict, and changing the trajectory of young lives. And she's had a lot of experience um, in thinking and working in this arena. And then the woman who got the big cheer, Olympia De La Flora. So she, the other two, welcome to Columbus, or welcome back to Columbus. <laughs> Olympia is obviously knows our town, which is fantastic, and is a principal at Ohio Avenue Elementary, where she has been providing amazing leadership um, on strategies that incorporate social emotional learning standards into, the, into their programming. Um, working with all of her teachers, we'll hear that to include self-awareness, self-control, self-management, social skills, relation skills, and responsible decision making. So so that's amazing. She's been involved as being the principal for six years. So again, thank you so much to all of you for being here. And the other that you may not know is we have, have been joined by some of the experts, both from Children's Hospital and partner organizations. So if we should get stumped at some point, we have some others here that can help us. So with that, without further ado, let me start. Dennis, you're up first. Can you start us off by telling or talking about what the research has to say about key prevention and early intervention strategies um, that are associated with the development of social emotional competencies of our youth? And then, and I'll, I'll remind you if you don't get to it, and then how that relates to the prevention of behavioral mental health disorders. So again, what does the research say about key prevention and intervention strategies? First thing, is that research is telling us that we have an epidemic of mental, emotional, or behavioral and psychiatric disorders. We have an honest to God epidemic that dwarfs the polio epidemic. One out of two of America's children will have a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. Those are things like addictions, ADHD, anxiety disorders, depression, et cetera, by age 18. That is a fact. We also know that they are, this prevalence rate is increasing significantly every two years. Now, we also know that on average, uh, well, we have uh, about 55 million children out of 70, 76 million children taking at least one prescription for a psychotropic medication. Did you hear that? That's published by the Wall Street Journal. That's the official publication of the Communist Party. That's a joke. <laughs> now, if, if every child had a pill every day, I would be standing on a hill of 1.6 billion pills per month. That gives you an idea. Let me tell you another thing. I gave a congressional testimony, and I asked, there were about 400 people in the room. I asked all the 30-somethings, which were better than half. I said, how many of you, of uh, 30-somethings, had a friend in college or high school complete suicide? Almost all of them raised their hands. Then I asked all of us, who were over 55, um, 70 this year, how many of us had somebody from our high school or our early college complete suicide? Only three people raised their hands. That's hard to misdiagnose a dead person. Now, what do we know about doing something about it? First, we know that coercion and punishment makes it worse. But a lot of people, and when you tune on the television, people will say, well, those, those children just need spanking, they need punishment, they need coercion, so uh, all sorts of things like that. What we also know is that we have to change the valence of peer reinforcement in the classrooms. Right now, most children get reinforced for bad behavior by peer attention. And I can show you that mathematically with an algebraic formula. We also know that that then wires the brain for threat. And humans are the major predator of humans. And humans are the major protector of other humans who are bad. And it's not determined by genes, it's determined by social relationships. So we've known this, I mean, it's actually in scripture. Thank you very much. <laughs> and science, you know, sort of proved that. 
So what I have started to do and my colleagues have started to do is can you actually engineer simple tools that teachers can use, like in Ohio Avenue, something like a little for transitions, reduces transitions from two to five minutes to 20 seconds. That means there's less aggression, bullying, pushing, shoving, name calling, and re negative peer reinforcement. That has an immediate effect on reducing anxiety and ADHD. So I'm teaching you simple things to know that it's not just a big thing. Then we teach students to write positive notes to each other. Those are called toodles. Toodles are the opposite of tattles. And toodle writing during school actually improves behavior moment by moment. And if those accumulate over time, our studies, I'm also a co-investigator at Johns Hopkins at the National Center for Prevention and Early Intervention. Johns Hopkins is a community college. Joke. <laughs> Um, we've been able to show that that peer reinforcement from first and second grade, that is what prevents suicide in adolescence and young adulthood. We also know a whole bunch of things of structural things. We also know some things about diet that you've never heard about. Increasing omega-3 fatty acid during pregnancy and reducing omega-6 fatty acid reduces lifetime mental illness in children. You've not heard about that, but the omega-6 and omega-3 don't happen in the proper ratios in school lunch programs. We also know the exposure to staying inside too long, which kids do. That actually increases the risk of mental illness in a whole variety of ways that I don't have time to talk about. But what I want to tell you is the good news that when you do these simple things, which we call like an evidence-based kernel, the smallest unit of behavioral influence, we're able to actually reduce psychiatric disorders and behavioral disorders in the immediate environment. In the immediate environment. We now have a peer-reviewed publication showing that we can reduce pediatric childhood psychi psychiatric disorders in a semester in a public health model published in the prevention, Journal of Prevention Science. Now, if you accumulate and you do more of this for several years, you get a long tail of that. And our studies at Hopkins then prevent suicide and addictions and also prevent a 64% lifetime reduction in opiate use. That's why we're doing PACS here. But I want to tell you we've got all these facts about the problem, and then we have amazing scientific articles that you can read at pubmed.gov. If anybody's a reader, write this down, www dot P-U-B M-E-D dot gov. That's the National Library of Medicine and you can riff off of everything I say and I know she's going to do some pitch hitting and she's going to do some pitch hitting. So that's the beginning. That's great and actually I think everyone should have received or and if you didn't we want to be sure you get one a, a, um, a brochure about PACS. So good. There you go. Um, and if you want a deep one that goes Lots of nerdy stuff. We have some of those. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Dennis. Yeah. So, Olympia, you've just been referred to, and clearly you are well known in this community for a variety of reasons, but in this case, for your efforts to engage parents and community providers to provide a school centered uh, response to support the social emotional needs of students. Can you talk a bit about the key elements of your approach, um, what you've learned and accomplished, and then I'll come back and probably remind you of, can you provide advice for? providers and other school personnel in the audience. But what have you learned? What, what are the key elements of your approach and what have you learned? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would, to just give you a little bit of background about Ohio Avenue, it's about 100% students in poverty, free and reduced lunch. And it's right next to Nationwide Children's Hospital, just right across the bridge. I remember when I first got the job there, I said, wonder if we're doing anything with Nationwide Children's Hospital, because I could see it every day. And a lot of our children experience what we call trauma, which may not be your definition of trauma, but it's anything that happens to a child or that their brain is exposed to at an early age that they may not be able to take in and understand what that means and have a healthy way of output. So a lot of homelessness. We have several of our students that are in and out of shelters. Uh, live in multiple different settings and 
have witnessed violent crimes, witnessed domestic violence. And if you think about a child's brain, it's, it's developing, it's growing. As adults, a lot of us, if we were to experience some type of traumatic event, we would have to seek counseling or get some kind of, of help and support. And with children seeing this and not getting any help and support, we're kind of setting them up for some of the things that Dennis talked about earlier. So it was a whole different kind of thinking and I'm thinking, oh, I'm an elementary school principal. This is gonna be so fun. I'll get to be with the little ones. And when I really started to recognize you know, what they were coming, coming to school with, I realized that we couldn't do it just by ourselves. So I see the power in partnering with community organizations, partnering with businesses. So one of the challenges I always say when I have the opportunity to speak is if you're not involved in helping out in a school in some way, you should be. Because a lot of these kids, they, they, they feel like they're the forgotten children. No one's coming. We don't have a PTO. We don't have a PTA. And so the volunteers that come into the building and the community supports are the people that help them understand that they matter. And that's a huge piece when you're talking about positive self-image and being able to rebound and be resilient from things that occur to you. So I started doing the research and we have several community partners because there's a huge need and we have different needs and every organization can't help all of the kids and we also have people come in that that do just simple reading buddies and we've made counseling cool at ohio avenue it used to be i remember i was talking to parents i'm like hey you know we should get your child hooked up with a counselor they you know they just experienced this traumatic event it could help them and they'd say no my kid doesn't need counseling you know, it had a negative stigma to it. And now even our reading buddies, the kids are like, when's my counselor coming? And I have to tell them, it's not your counselor, it's your reading buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about a lot of these kids just haven't really been exposed to that. And so my prime mission was to get my staff the tools that they needed to be successful because teachers are not coming into teaching, knowing how to deal with the things that we're dealing with. And one of the stories that Catherine actually wrote about in the article is it's one of the most traumatic ones I, I've, I've had. I have a fourth grade male student who came to me. He was transferred from another school because he assaulted a teacher. And he got assigned to my school. And of course, he was running through my building and having severe behavior issues. And I finally got him to my office and I started talking to him. Well, not even a week before he came to me, he had witnessed a violent crime. Someone came into his home. His mother and the person who came into his home pulled out guns. He witnessed a shooting, and they just enrolled him in my school. Of course, he may be feeling threatened and may come up to a teacher who he has no relationship with. And so helping teachers understand it's not personal. You don't know what this child has been through the night before or maybe even the day on their way to school. So working with these partners, like I don't have time to do the research because I'm doing the action, but he can help teachers understand these are simple things you can do. Like we used to clap to get the kids' attention. <laughs> Not thinking that could sound like a gunshot. It could sound like a child who's been beaten, that a sound like that. And so a child hearing that could send them into some kind of traumatic event. The harmonica is a peaceful way most of our kids have never heard, even heard a harmonica. And so, and it's a non-threatening way. It doesn't point someone out and say, Johnny, you're not in the line, please get in the line. It doesn't reinforce what he's saying, that negative behavior. So little things like that, getting teachers the skills that they need. Teachers wanna help kids. They wouldn't be teaching, trust me, they wouldn't be teaching if they didn't wanna help kids. But we can't say, I'm expecting you to know how to deal with all of these mental health issues when none of their college instruction helped them prepare for what types of things that they're seeing. I'm not prepared as a principal for the things that I'm seeing. So I have to partner and I have to help provide professional development to my teachers so that we can function and we can give kids not only an academic foundation but a social emotional foundation. Because in my opinion, if they're not they don't have what they need socially, socially and emotionally, they're never gonna to get to the academic side. So, that's, I think that's it. Did I cover everything? <laughs> Did I miss anything? I've written about 10 more questions <laughs> down. <laughs> and by the way, we are 
teaching pre-service teachers to use PACs in Ohio. It's the only state that's doing that. Just started. Pre, what did you say? Pre pre-service. Pre, pre-service. Ah, before they even come out. online. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear. Okay, well, there's a lot more to dig into here, but I'm gonna to turn to, and actually, um, thank you, Olympia. You actually alluded to being made famous in an article that um, was written about many things um, by Catherine. So Catherine, let me um, turn to not that article, that's the Atlantic article, if you wanna Google that and find out. But Catherine um, has a newly released book that documents the new theory of discipline that focuses on strengthening children's connections, communication, and capability. And you believe, I believe, that's what I think, um, that this might actually reverse the unsettling trends that we're seeing. So can you speak a little bit about your journey to discover and then to describe the apprenticeship model you're, you're focused on, which centers on listening, I understand, listening and building children's skills to address the root causes of misbehavior rather than the reactionary um, incentives and consequences that we've just been talking about. Well, thank you so much, and I'm just thrilled to be here uh, speaking to a room of people who all really care about these issues and are and working to make kids' lives better, and uh, especially honored to be with Dennis and Olympia, who I've sort of stalked and bugged for, you know, f five or six years now <laughs> writing this book. So um, my journey to, to write this book, The Good News About Bad Behavior, which I happen to have a copy, um, <laughs> why kids are less disciplined than ever and what to do about it, um, really began not in my role as a journalist, which I've been for 20 years, but as a mother of uh, three kids. And when my um, ch child Maddie started kindergarten and I started volunteering on the playground and um, was sort of responsible for kids' safety and making sure they played nicely, and I was uh, watching the little kindergartners play their little round faces and their chubby legs and these gigantic fourth and fifth grade boys were kind of whipping ten balls, kickballs and basketballs back and forth and I thought it looked kind of dangerous so I walked up to them and I said, boys, could you please play a little nicer so you don't hurt the kindergartners? So anyone want to guess what they said? <laughs> Did they say, thank you so much, Mrs. Lewis, for pointing out the error of our ways? No. No, they did not say that. They just, they just ignored me. So I figured they must not have heard, right? <laughs> so I walk up a little closer, use my big girl voice, look them straight in the eye. Boys, you're playing too roughly. Stop. And again, look through me like I was a ghost. Mm -hmm. So I was just stunned. This is totally different than the behavior I remembered from when I was in, in elementary school in a very similar kind of suburban, um, you know, gr green, gra green grass and trees, uh, middle class neighborhood outside of Washington, D.C. And then as I, my kids grew, went through the school, I was volunteering as a Girl Scout leader and I was coaching Odyssey of the Mind teams. And in all these settings, behavior was an issue. Mm -hmm. And again, it was just very different than I remembered as <clears throat> from my childhood that um, a kid would be kind of popping up out of his seat and or, or asking me every five minutes when is my mom coming to pick me up and the parents would say oh he has ADHD or she has anxiety and you know we've as Dennis was saying been touched by suicide of young people and I started wondering is it just my imagination or is something really wrong with kids today is there something different about kids behavior and that's when I put on my journalist hat and um, really started looking through the research studies. I use PubMed.gov and, um, and started looking at the data. And one of the first statistics I came across was this one that Dennis mentioned, that one in two children, by the time they're 18, will have a mood or behavioral disorder or a substance addiction. And it's a National Institutes of Mental Health study of more than 10,000 kids, representative sample, um, and it, that's sort of, the, the undeniable figure where you think every, and if your child's in preschool, every other kid in that class is gonna have something pretty major they're managing by the time they're 18. So challenges with behavior, thoughts, emotion, regulating those kinds of, um, those kinds of challenges. So um, <clears throat> then I kept digging more because I did have this question, is this overdiagnosis or maybe just better diagnosis? Maybe all those 75 million pills a day are needed, right? For kids to have 
um, mental health. And I came across the suicide statistics, which um, the most updated figures from the CDC show that in the last decade, kids 10 to 14, um, the suicide rate has doubled. And it's gone up 41% for children 15 to 19. And I quote Dennis in my talks all the time, you cannot diagnose overdiagnose a dead body. There's just something undeniably different. There's a lot more, you know, statistics that I actually look at the, in my book I talk about the um, symptoms that kids report and young people report and how that's changed over time and you can see the huge uptick in like distractibility, trouble sleeping, um, worrisome thoughts, and those are things that are real that you can't explain away by us being more aware of childhood and adolescent mental illness. So from identifying this problem and convincing myself this is a real problem, I then started looking for solutions. And I spent five years going across the country shadowing teachers, wonderful uh, teachers like in Ohio Avenue Elementary School, who just let me be a fly on the wall to see what was happening in their classrooms. I, I shadowed families, I went into research labs, and ended up writing about four different models that teach children self-regulation. So they're actually explicitly helping kids to learn to manage those emotions, big emotions, worrisome thoughts, and impulsive behavior, difficult behavior. And so one of those models is the PACS Good Behavior Game. Um, and I went to a lot of different schools to, to observe PACS. And I ended up focusing on Ohio Avenue Elementary School um, in part because Olympia is a very open and transparent principal who just is, is very welcoming and didn't have anything to hide about the good, the bad, and the ugly of what happens in a school building every single day, no matter the school. There's things going on that, um, that people who aren't educators may not really understand. Um, I also wrote about uh, <clears throat> three other models um, in the book and tried to pull out from there the principles that they all share in common, which are, as Teresa mentioned, a very strong connection between an adult and a child. And I really believe this is the foundation for kids to learn self-regulation. Because if they're seeing an adult self-regulate, if they even have that, that empathy, the physical touch, sometimes a, a sort of gentle touch on an arm, will actually help kids' brains to calm down from that agitated state to be able to access the prefrontal cortex where they solve problems and think critically and make good decisions. Um, number two is the communication about whatever's going wrong. And so in the PACS Good Behavior game, the teachers and the kids talk about what do we want to see in our classroom? What do we, how do we want to feel? At the beginning of the year, they set sort of classroom rules that define how that group is going to function so that children have buy-in. And um, Olympia has said, you know, they have a, a chart on the wall for math facts and for the alphabet. So of course they're going to have a behavior chart that talks about these are our, our group expectations. And she didn't make the chart. The teacher didn't make the chart. The kids came up with it them, themselves through the Pax Good Behavior Game. So that's the second principle that all of these discipline models share. And the third one is a focus on capability building as opposed to rewards or punishment. So think of the child who's acting out as missing a skill, who they need better control of their emotions or they need to manage transitions or there's something going on beyond this kid is making my life hard. Because that's not the reason they're doing it. It may be the effect, but it's not the reason. If we focus on the things that actually can change in that child, then we move everyone to a collaborative solution that makes that child's mental and behavioral health stronger. Well, I would love to just sit here and keep going for hours and hours, which we won't do, I promise you, but thank you. So to the rest, this is not just my conversation, it's our conversation. So in the next really two minutes or so, if you have a question to ask, please head over. I think Jane's headed over by the microphone as well, but please, um, in just a couple minutes, we will open this up for your questions um, and comments as well. So I'm filled with, <laughs> questions and thoughts, et cetera. But let me, I, I could follow up, but I just can't ask uh, two things I have to know. One is, it's really a toss up, what's going on? What is driving this? What is driving this huge escalation? I th you know, is it really social media? Is it the change in our families and our structures? Is it the stress that parents and all of us are feeling? Or is there something else? Or is it diet? Or, or is it all of that? Yes. Okay. All right. 
so, so there's a lot to work on in that arena. Anything else that, that any of you would add? And then I do have another question before well, anybody else gets I mean, I talk, I talk about this in my book, so I'm happy to share sort of my own sort of conclusion from the research that I did, um, is that there's three factors. One is the disappearance of childhood play. Yep. Um, and outdoor time. That was is such an important way that kids learn to self-regulate and even just to manage themselves to, to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Number two is media, the growth of media, technology, and not just social media, but all of our outward focus on who we want to be is like a YouTube star, a reality television star. It's not intrinsic focus, which is associated with mental health. And number three is um, that kids are really unemployed. They don't have a role in the family or the community where they contribute, where they have a household job, or they watch a younger sibling, or they you know, have some way to belong where they are actually doing something where they can see the impact of their efforts. And that, that sort of connection with the group that they're in is, is lost in so many different communities for many different reasons. I, wow. I would riff on that um, to explain a few things. When the child plays a computer game in 1999, there was a publication in Nature magazine, which changed my entire world view about this. And what that showed is when they hit a button and destroy a target, they get a hit of dopamine in their brain. Now what they've done is associated harm to others and things with pleasure. That is not a good thing. I went, oh, blank, when I read that. And I would tell you that probably the game industry and the phone industry spends far more money on studying with brain machinery, studying the brains of children than the entirety of the National Institutes of Mental Health. I wish I had those toys to play with. Um, the unemployment thing in homes, in schools, the, if 50 percent of the children have a meaningful job role in the building, behavior will be substantially better, academics will be less better, uh, vandalism will be better, and there will be less juvenile delinquency. We've known that from a very powerful publication that appeared in 1972. <laughs> okay? And I, I think um, the, the reinforcement issue is that now peers are reinforcing deviant behavior. We, can, we actually code this in 10 second interval coding as a behavior analyst and as a child psychologist. It's almost there will be 1,500 peer reinforcements for negative behavior that might be a, something like that. Then those are happening, and 1,500 of those happening in one hour in a classroom. And they're invisible. And as a teacher or principal, you can only say, good job, thank you, about once a minute. So the peer negative reinforcement is driving this, and that's creating the bullying and the mental illness. So again, it's an evolution of what's happened in our culture, but we actually have practical tools that are simple and stupid. Playground uh, activities, organized games are part of that. Wow. I still have another key question, but I'm going to defer. <laughs> so so um, let me just remind you all that it's an opportunity to not make a long statement, but to pose a question to our panelists. So let's keep the conversation going. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, this is just one quick question. Uh, I know you mentioned a lot of statistics, and it sounds like it was just based off an average. Do you have a breakdown or an aggregate um, of statistics based on um, the different demographics? Um, of the people that you study? Yes. Um, those are national averages, but if you live in poverty, they'll be worse. If your color of your skin is darker than this piece of paper, you will be in trouble. Uh, if you are Native American, you will be in trouble. If you're poor, you will be, your children will have more trouble. If you're eating a diet that is mo mostly funded by food stamps, you will be worse because it has 20% of the kilocalories are from soybean oil and cottonseed oil, which increase the risk of lifetime mental illness, suicide, and addictions. And guess what state raises a lot of soybean oil and cottonseed oil? So you don't know about that, but that's in that pubmed.gov. And you can read the articles uh, by the chief molecular membrane laboratory scientist. His name is Joseph Heblin uh, in pubmed. 
Does that answer your question? Okay. Though I'd like to follow up, that was a, going along my question, so thank you for posing that. Good, good partnering. So some of you may know and may have heard me say this, but you know the Annie E. Casey Foundation released a study recently that showed that Ohio is 42nd out of 44 states for the well-being of African-American youth. Um, and the World Health Organizations and others talk about all kinds of things, but as far as the social determinants of health and well-being, they have noted in the mental health and behavioral health arena three key things that include social inclusion, we talked about that, the lack of access to <coughs> economic resources, so poverty, and the issues of freedom from discrimination and violence, which really get translated into race and racism. So playing on that, I guess we've heard some of the dilemmas you've just said, it's worse. So what should we be doing for those who may have a darker skin or have less access to economic resources, less social inclusion? What, what do we do? How do we act? Well, I, I would say we need to, in terms of the school setting, um, that's what got me interested in this issue because um, school discipline still in this country is, is, is primarily punishment. Right, it's suspensions, expulsions, and those fall disproportionately on children of color and also children with learning disabilities. So reforming that model and moving away from punishment towards the kind of practices like the PACS Good Behavior Game and the um, <clears throat> therapeutic services that Nationwide Children's Hospital provides in a school setting, that is gonna support kids um, and it'll, it'll be, have the most impact on kids who are the most marginalized and disadvantaged. Um, I would add to that, uh, if you look up my name and spanking in Google, you'll get about 88,000 hits, pun intended. And what I proved in my dissertation research was if you had an impulsive child and you spanked them for impulsive behavior, they increased their impulsivity because it secured parental attention. Um, the other thing I'd want to say that's really, really important that I missed saying, which is the airborne lead levels in the uh, 3,011 counties in the lower 48 of the United States predict violence and juvenile delinquency. And our children of color live in neighborhoods with the highest levels of airborne lead levels. If, however, the mother's, uh, if the umbilical cord you don't clamp the cord until the placenta stops beating, it takes about eight minutes maybe, you will reduce the lifetime lead burden of all children. That's in randomized control group studies published in pubbent.gov. We don't do that because it's more economical to clamp the cord and push the person out of the OBY gen. Now, how that med medicine works, that's another complication, but there's a whole lot of things also on that um, website is the single best strategy to treat uh, serious cocaine, heroin, and opiate addictions called the prize bowl uh, by Nancy Petrie, and we should be teaching that to every community. Every community agency can learn how to do that. Church groups can learn how to do that. That will reduce these problems substantially. Thank you. Yeah. So your turn. Your question? Thank you. I'm Chris West. I have the privilege of managing the Early Childhood Mental Health Program at Nationwide Children's. We have um, begun to embark on a parenting program. The Ohio Children's Trust Fund has allowed us the opportunity to provide Triple P, the Positive Parenting Program, in a 16 or 13 county um, area here in Central Ohio. It's a, been a phenomenal experience so far. But one of the things that really troubles us is reaching the families that you, you talk about, the families that are most in need of the services. Being free, being in your neighborhood is not always enough. And I was just hoping that maybe from each of your vantage points you could help us a little bit with messaging or um, marketing that might be um, able to draw folks into the door. I would gladly respond to that one. <laughs> So I think that people have this misconception that there's no parent involvement in yeah. schools in poverty. And I even went into it like that. But when I started to realize how the school was set up for parents to be involved in their schedules, I started to realize, well, every time I call them, they do call me back. Or if I email them or text them, they do respond. They care about their kids. They want their kids to be successful. They want their kids to be resilient. But I realized every time we have parent-teacher conferences, it was always at the same time. 
and some of our parents work and some of our parents don't know what their schedule is going to be the week before. A lot of our parents are working class and actually one of my parents is a server today. So I just thought, oh, when I call her, you need to come pick your kid up. What's she supposed to do? Stop, stop working the luncheon? And so at Ohio, we've done some different types of ways to engage parents. One of them is texting. Um, we also, a lot of the teachers use something called Class Dojo, which is pretty much texting. You can send pictures back and forth with a parent. Um, we've done, we've utilized our email access. We utilize 24-hour voicemail. So we tell parents, hey, if no one's in the office, leave a voicemail message. Someone will check it as soon as we get in in the morning. And then we've been unconventional in how we host our, our meetings. We have had parent engagement activities on Saturdays, on Sundays, at night, in the morning, in the middle of the day. We have, you know, hey, you can come in between 11 and 12 today and we'll have staff here that can assist you or we can do a parenting class or a parenting support. We can do it before school, we can do it after school. So in our mind, we say, oh, working is, you know, eight to five, eight to four. And so, but the, but the real world is not that way. So I say meet parents where they're at. You know, take a, you know, take a, not a food truck, but you know, like a truck. <laughs> you know, we always say in, in Columbus, our, our children now have to come to a central place to get enrolled. Well, what if they can't get to that central place? Why don't we take something out into the neighborhood and say, you know what, we're gonna be at such and such library. You can come and get your kids enrolled in school. You can get your kids these health things. And, and the mobile van at Nationwide Children's helps with that. But we have to go to, we have to meet our parents where they're at. They are our clientele. Our students are our clientele. And so we have to change our ways to meet their needs. Would you go to a business that wasn't meeting your needs? This is what I always say. So why should we expect people to still, you know, oh yeah, the, the school is doing such a great job, the hospital's doing such a great job, but we're not meeting the needs of the people that we're there to serve. To riff on that, <clears throat> um, Triple P, uh, is probably the most evidence-based parenting program in the world, but most of you don't know about a particular set of studies that would be most valuable and could be done here. The population level study in South Carolina uh, did very simple strategies that you are referencing and you know about um, for what are called level one. That's media-based strategies promoted on <coughs> simple things, evidence-based kernels that teachers can't, uh, that parents can use at home to help their children in the normal places these things happen. At the grocery store, trying to get your kid ready for work and get them to turn the television off, to pick up their clothes, to brush their teeth, to take a bath. All of those simple things can be promoted on television and can have an effect. They can also be delivered by a very simple t uh, TV pr um, online program. And then small seminars. How many of you go to a church? Okay. You can have these uh, after, on Sunday for about 20 minutes, and that will make a difference. So very simple programmatic things. You don't need to have a home visitor or to see a psychiatrist for 12 sessions in order to have parenting impact. That particular study showed an extraordinary reduction in all forms of child maltreatment using population level data. And I want to call to your attention that it is not just poor people. So the study showed in North Carolina and South Carolina that the official reports of child physical maltreatment were underestimated by a factor of 40 when they did random digit telephone calling. And child sexual abuse was underestimated by a factor of 15 on random digit phone calls. And that include people who lived in nice houses, drove nice cars, and had nice clothes to cover up those things. That is not just in Ohio Avenue. Wow, so we're gonna try really hard. Very quick, we're coming to the very end of our time. So do you have one question and a quick response? I apologize. Uh, that's okay. John Hardy from Community Shelter Board. I was just asking, by the time they're in their late teens, early 20s, is it too late or is it reversible? Yes, how it's reversible. About that? A little harder. Yeah. A little harder, but the same techniques? Is yep. that what? Yep. Yeah. We've used the same techniques with violent felony offender juveniles. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's great to hear. And yes. 
my name is Sonia Nelson, and I manage the Resident Initiatives Department at Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority. So all the families that you said that were in trouble, it made me very nervous because you talked about our families. And so with us having that responsibility of serving the, um, over 16,000 families in Franklin County, what should I do when I go back to the office today to get this started? <laughs> well, I think I think that, that we have said so many negative things today. I think that I'd love to share one optimistic perspective, which is that so often we look at kids with mental health or behavioral health challenges as broken or damaged or in trouble. And if one in two kids has something going on, it's actually really the norm. So these are, this is a perspective shift that we need for all of our kids and yes. all our communities that we just need to teach them to manage their emotions, behavior, and thoughts. And they all need um, you know, support as opposed to somehow um, this being only certain, certain communities. So I would say you know, go, go to find the resources that you think will be helpful for your communities and just talk about them. And the other question I was thinking, what if there were like a three minute video that people could get on their, vid their cell phone that would help them with a parenting strategy or help them with you know, discipline? Like that's the kind of thing that might be easier to deliver to busy families than like coming somewhere. As you were okay, saying. time out. And <laughs> I, I, I think, sorry. We're, lo we're losing. We're losing time. Okay. So we can talk later because there are very be practical strategies for housing perfect. authorities. Perfect. So with that, and actually, I had some closing thoughts, but really, they've been stolen. We all are. <laughs> There's, it feels like there's nothing more imperative to both think about this, to learn more about this, but to support. So whether you're a donor or a funder or a business leader, uh, work in a school, work in a community agency, a governmental entity, there is something here for all of us to think about. So I'd ask you to both think about that, but to do more than think and continue to learn and to act. So with that, thank you to our panelists. You are amazing. There's more to think about. And Carol, it's back to you. I hope you all enjoyed today's forum. I found it a bit scary, but at the same time, hopeful. Um, so thank you again. Uh, please help me thank our sponsors, Mark, Mount Carmel Health Systems and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Thank you. And of course, let's thank our speakers once more, Mr. Dennis Embry, Catherine Reynolds-Lewis, Olympia Della Flora, and of course, our host, Dr. Teresa Long. Thank you. See you, see you all next Wednesday.